top is netting. Yes, it's the black veil. <laughs> no. So I want to start out talking about your childhood. Can you just describe your family to me? Was it unorthodox, really traditional? We, we were your um, 50s family. Uh, my father was a dentist. My mother was at home. Uh, I have an older brother. And everything looked good to the world. Now, did they have particular views that you knew of um, about gender roles? Did they have anything that you were aware of uh, about boys versus girls? I identified totally with my father, <laughs> um, not so much my mother. And I wanted to do what my father and my brother were doing. And I was always welcome. My father was a, a very creative person, very good with his hands, creative in every way, sang songs wrote poems, just, I adored him. And uh, he would sit me on the workbench downstairs, the basement workbench, and give me a hammer and, you know, a block of wood and some nails. And I, that's where I, that's where I wanted to be. And um, I really think that he encouraged me that I could reach for the stars. Uh, Sadly, he died when I was 21 and never saw any of this. So when I was young, um, I really identified more with my father, um, wanted to be just like him. And he was, he was the, actually the more nurturing parent. My mother was very anxious, and um, she did give me her love of reading, my father too. I mean, my house was filled with books and there was nothing off limits. I mean, reading was a good thing in my family. It was good that Judy sat on the floor and pulled off books, never mind that it was the Fountainhead and Lysistrata. It was okay. And, you know, and so I read. I didn't necessarily understand what I was reading, but I, I loved it. And they both read a lot. And my mother was very shy, very private, never could really talk to me about anything. Um, she, she would arrange for my father to have the talks with me. My father told me about menstruation, and I had not a clue what he was talking about. He took me on his lap because I asked the question. I was nine, and my 13-year-old cousin said, when I said, what's wrong with you, because she wasn't feeling well that day, she said, you'll find out when you're 13. So, you know, all the way home from their house, it's like, what? What will I find out, Daddy? What? What? And he tried to explain to me a lunar cycle, and I had no idea. So I thought when the moon is full, every woman in the world has this wonderful thing happening to her, this menstruation thing and I used to look out at the full moon and think uh-huh uh-huh <laughs> I just I didn't get it I didn't get it but he made an effort you know he made an effort talk to me more about yourself at that time in life I mean you write so well about adolescence I'm wondering if you can paint a picture for me pre-adolescent pre I'm good at pre-adolescent what were you like as a pre-adolescent at first I was painfully shy um, when I was really little and afraid of everything, like my mother. And I, re I remember hiding behind her skirt, holding on to her leg when I was really small, when somebody wanted me to come to their house for dinner. And then I don't know what happened, but um, when I was about 10, we went, we, we actually moved away for a while, my mother and my brother and my grandmother and I, because my brother was sick, leaving my beloved father um, at home. And I think those two years away, uh, just, I don't know, they turned me into a much more outgoing, theatrical, dramatic, I lived inside my head. I mean, I had so many, such a rich, imaginative life. Uh, I was never, you know, I never felt alone because I had everything going on in my head. What were you uh, imagining? I, I was imagining everything. My husband says, I still do. He said, Judy hears one word and she turns it into a whole thing. He, he doesn't always say that kindly, although usually he does. But um, I had a rich 
inner life that I never shared with anyone. I think that is how I became a writer. I'm sure it's how many people become writers. It's not so much the books, it's the, it's the, it's the imagination. It's, I had stories in my head all the time. I, n I never shared them, I never wrote them down. I was afraid if I told anybody they would think I was, you know, very strange and that wouldn't be good. So your mother wanted you to go to college and get married and have, basically have the life that she had. Did you follow her advice? That's really interesting because, you know, looking back, was she happy? Might she have been happier if she had had work? Um, and I think yes. I once asked her, her, both her younger brother and her younger sister were teachers. And when my mother was much older in life, I asked her if she had any regrets. And it was hard to talk to her because she would cry. And she said, well, I guess I regret that I was never a teacher. I think it was that I never had, you know, that something that they had. Although she was forced into, into it because my father died, she was only 54 as he was, and what are you gonna do? And um, my aunt encouraged her to go out and get a job, and she did. So did you follow her advice? Did you go on and have a husband? I think I did. I, I think I did um, see her advice as more practical. You know, the acting bug that bit me and my father said, we'll go and we'll, you know, you'll go to New York and you'll have lessons and, um, which sounded wonderful to me, except that I didn't want to give up Saturdays because I wanted to be at the football game and go dancing at the Y with the other kids. And um, by the time I was in high school, I think I was looking ahead to, uh, to, yeah, getting the degree in education in case, God forbid, I ever had to teach. I don't know what I was thinking, to tell you the truth, but to meet the guy, to get married, to have babies, to be the president of the PTA. <laughs> That's where I was in the 50s. And so you went to college. And I went you, to college. You met a man. I went to college. Um, I met someone not at college, but mm -hmm. through a party that I went to. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm, I was married at 21. I was a junior in college. So talk to me about your life as a married woman. You moved to New Jersey and just describe that for me. Well, we were from New Jersey. Both of us were from New Jersey and he was a young lawyer already practicing. He was six and a half years older than I was. A grown up, I thought. I'm marrying a grown up, you know? It never occurred to me that I should be the grown up. I'm marrying a grown up. He has grown up friends, they have children. This is so exciting. Um, that was the fantasy part of it. What was the reality? I was at home with two young babies. I had two babies by the time I was 25. And, you know, this is the thing. What happens to the very creative child when she grows up and she doesn't have the outlet that I, that I had at school. I mean, there was always an outlet for the creativity as long as I was in school, even at college. And suddenly, uh, I, love, I love baby care. I really, I still, to this day, I like babies. And I like taking care of them. But I was, um, things weren't right with me. I was sick throughout my 20s on and off, one exotic illness after another. Nobody ever knew exactly what was wrong. Um, and once my first book was accepted for publication, that was the end of it. So clearly I wasn't really happy in my 20s, even though I love those babies. Um, I think life married life was a lot different. The reality of it was a lot different than what I expected. I don't know what I expected. I was a romantic. And it's, it's, it's so interesting for me to look back and see how writing changed my life. 
cured me physically, um, allowed me to soar um, emotionally and intellectually, gave me everything, really made me who I am today. And I don't know what would have happened to me had I not found that creative outlet. I, I would like to think that I would have found something because it didn't have to be writing, but it had to be the creative outlet. I don't know where I got the idea. I started to make, this is really silly, um, felt pictures, that is pictures out of pieces of felt for children's bedrooms to do something, you know? I needed it and it was exciting, it was fun. And I packed them into a suitcase one day and I took the bus to New York and I schlepped them to Bloomingdale's and somebody took pity on me and said, oh, you want to see the children's buyer and he's in today, children's furniture buyer. And I went up there and I unzipped the suitcase and I showed them and he said, oh, okay, uh, we'd like this one and this one in these colors and they'll be the samples and then we'll call you and we'll pay you nine dollars a piece because we're going to sell them for 18. Oh, that was so exciting. I cannot tell you how exciting. And then um, I guess my son was about two and he and the little girl next door um, would come over and they'd sit on the floor and play with little scraps as I would glue and make these. It was very, very satisfying for a while. And I made all of $350. And it was enough. When my fingers started to um, peel, you know, from the glue, I got allergic to the glue, I, I bought an electric typewriter. And I don't know what I was thinking. Maybe I was already, you know, thinking about books and rhymes, and I was going to be the next Dr. Seuss. My maiden name was Sussman. It was very close. I thought I could be the next Dr. Seuss. And so I made up rhymes, 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 washing the dinner dishes, rhymes, rhymes, rhymes. And I wrote them down, and I tried to illustrate them myself with colored pencils. And I fastened them together with brass fasteners, like, you know, you did a little project at school. And um, I would send them in to publishers. And the first few times they were rejected, uh, they came back. The mailman knew what I was doing, and he and I, you know, we would, we would share a little sadness there. And I would go into my closet and I would cry. But I was a kind of determined person. And, um, one day there was an announcement in the mail about a course in writing for tweens, and um, I signed up for it. It was at NYU, and I was already writing, and I got a tremendous amount of professional encouragement from that teacher. And, I mean, that was the most exciting thing in my life, that Monday nights were the highlight of my week because on Monday nights I got to take the bus into New York and go down to NYU and this was mine, this was mine. You know, I had two small children and um, my husband would take them out to dinner that night out for hamburgers, whatever little kids ate. And there I was in a room with 10 other people who were interested in the same thing that I was interested in. And um, a teacher who was from another generation, really, she was out of the 40s and um, gave us so many rules for writing children's books, rules that I broke right away. But she encouraged me. She was supportive of me. And that is such a gift that she gave to me. And when that course ended, I signed up and I took it again. I wasn't ready to um, be without that once a week feedback. And when that class ended, then what did you do? When that class ended, uh, I sold a couple of stories while I was in that class. And I was writing Iggy's House, a very early um, chapter book, my, my first chapter book. 
although we didn't call them chapter books then, I don't know what I thought it was. It was a book. And I wrote it, uh, you know, I, I turned in a chapter a week. And at the end of the second semester, I had a manuscript. And um, I read the little writer's magazines, and I chose a publishing company. New, it said new, young publishing company looking for realistic middle grade fiction. And I sent it to them and I got a call. Will you come and meet with us? Ah, oh. ah, oh. I have no sense of direction. And they weren't in New York. I knew how to get to New York because you took the bus or the train, but I didn't know how to get to Englewood Cliffs, New Jersey, and I had to do it in the car. And I was so nervous and I was so dressed then. I thought, you know, this is a business meeting and I had a little dress, very mod. So it must have been very late 60s maybe. I think the book was published in 69. So it was all stripes, mod dress and, and it had a little coat with the stripes going the other way and little mod shoes and a mod haircut. <laughs> and I went, and this was this tiny, grungy little office because Bradbury Press was starting out within another, with an umbrella company. And I met Dick Jackson, who is only the world's greatest editor. And how lucky is that? You know, it was a day when you could be discovered in the slush pile. I didn't have an agent. I didn't know anybody. I didn't know anybody who wrote or had ever written. I, I mean, I was really alone in this, but what a thrill. And he talked to me about it. He asked me a lot of questions, and those questions released something in me. And, and we've always worked together the same way. He asked the questions, and that would open up just floods of new ideas for me. And I remember thinking, I heard them send out for sandwiches, and I thought, oh, are they going to invite me to stay for lunch? And they didn't. <laughs> but um, I went home, no promise of a contract, just we'd like to see your revision. We're very interested. And I worked hard, and I, I've always been so much better at revising than at original drafts. Um, and then one day the phone rang, and he offered me $800. That was my advance. And I said, I read in a magazine that I'm supposed to get $1,000. <gasps> I don't know where I had the guts. And he said to me, well, we want some place to go with the next book, don't we? <laughs> I love that. I still tease him about that. And um, it was a thrill. It wasn't the first book that was accepted. The first book was a picture book. The one in the middle is The Green Kangaroo. That's such a great story. But it didn't, that didn't have the personal, um, you know, the, the personal face-to-face -face with this editor who would become so important to my life and my career. So talk to me about how your career started to, uh, it started to build and build, and can you just describe for me how that first book went, and then? Well, I don't know what would have happened with just Iggy's House, but then the next book was Are You There, God, It's Me, Margaret. And um, you know what it was? It was like, okay, I know all the rules, but I don't care about the rules. I'm just gonna go back and write what I remember to be true about being in sixth grade. And I remembered everything. You know, I was um, not quite 30, I guess. Maybe I was just 30, going on three. And I, but my memory was, you know, for detail, for everything. I mean, it was right, just right there, scratched the surface. And I was 12. I was more comfortable with 12-year-old me than 30-year-old me. I knew who I was when I was 12. I had no idea who I was when I was 30 or 25 or, you know. I just, I didn't know. And, and I have to tell you, from the day the first book was accepted, 
Um, I never got sick again, uh, except, you know, the way people do. But all of those awful and exotic illnesses of my 20s disappeared because there was something to be excited about every day. You know, get out of bed and you knew that you were going to get the kids off to school and get to have those quiet hours alone in that room with the little $300 typewriter. <laughs> it was very exciting. It was a wonderful time and and I had so, so much inside me that I went from book to book to book to book. I would send off one and I'd start the next one. I just didn't want to be without it. It was so important to me. It so changed my life. Now talk to me about why you chose 12 because that is a really particular moment in a lifetime and can you just go a little bit further with why that age is so special? Um, 12 as I knew it then, 12 when I was a kid was a little bit different than 12 now, probably the equivalent of maybe 10. I mean you are on the brink. Um, every experience is, is a first, is new, is exciting. Uh, and you're not, you're not a teenager yet. You don't have all of the hormonal problems and the, and the angst of being a teenager. It just seemed to me like a wonderful time. Um, not, not, I don't mean wonderful. I mean wonderful time to write about. Wonderful time for me to think about. Now, being 10, Talk 11. to me about, are you there, God, it's me, Margaret. I mean, I'm sure most people have read, at least most girls have read that book, but just if you can describe Margaret as a character and what she was going through for people who aren't familiar. Well, oh, Margaret is, um, so, so much of me is in Margaret. Um, Margaret, again, is on the brink. Um, She's, she's a late developer. The, the rest of her friends are already starting. She is desperate to be normal. She wants to be normal. And, and God is her confidant as he was mine or she was mine. After I read Erica Jong, I started calling her, her. <laughs> and I talk to God as a confidant the way Margaret does, but not about religious issues, about you know, oh please, God, I just want to be normal. Please make me grow. Please let me get my period. Um, you know, I made, actually, the reality is when I was separated from my father, um, my, much more like starring Sally J. Friedman as herself, I am, that's my most autobiographical book, and I'm really Sally J, or a lot of me is Sally J, and Sally uh, had a relationship with God and Sally became ritualistic and set up all these prayers to protect her father. If, if I say this 10 times a day, um, then my father will be safe. It, it, I mean, it's a terrible, terrible burden uh, for a child to take it upon herself to protect and keep a parent safe who isn't with her. And flying was so new then to me. The idea of flying, I had never flown. And every month he would fly down to see us. And I had to do so much to make sure that he would be safe um, on those planes and safe without the rest of us in the house looking after him. So Margaret's relationship with God, after all, I wrote about Margaret before I wrote about Sally, and Margaret's relationship with God was also similar to mine. Um, but I made Margaret a child of mixed religious background. Um, that's not true for me. And um, because my brother had married someone who wasn't Jewish, and I saw his children, you know, and they weren't quite sure what they were. And we weren't very religious in our family, but we were culturally Jewish. Uh, and we, we went to synagogue uh, the way Margaret goes with her grandmother. And I counted hats and feathers and colors of hats um, the, way, the way Margaret did. And I didn't understand any of what was going on, nor did I feel close to God when I went to synagogue, but in my room alone at night, God and I, 
were there for each other. And then Margaret, uh, you know, she likes boys. She's just starting to like boys, and I like them. I can remember in first grade thinking, should I marry Jimmy or Tommy? This is how I was raised. Should I marry Jimmy or Tommy? Which name do I like better? That was in first grade. So it goes way back. <laughs> um, so how did the book do? Talk to me about uh, the publication of Are You There, Got It to Me, Margaret, and the, well, the reaction to it. Well, Margaret um, got this rave review in the New York Times, which just floored me. I had to sit on the floor. Um, I didn't even know what it meant, really. I didn't know how important it was. And that was the first time I thought, oh my God, maybe I can really do this. Maybe she knows something that I don't know. Maybe I'm a writer. Maybe I can tell these stories. I didn't really think of myself so much as a writer as maybe I can do this, whatever this was. Maybe maybe I'm going to be able to keep doing this, and wouldn't that be fun? And of course, you know, it came out very mixed, um, very mixed reviews from everybody. You know, this was outrageous. Uh, my, my wonderful writing instructor from NYU, dear person, said to me, um, well, she said, I don't know about all this practice in here, about getting your periods, about, you know, filling your bra with cotton. I don't know about it all, but she said, but it's a good book. And she was never, never anything but kind and generous to me. Yeah, Margaret brought me my first readers. You know, it was the beginning of everything that was to come. Although my children, who were in elementary school, public elementary school then in New Jersey, I gave um, the school library three copies and the male principal refused to have them on the shelf. That was also the beginning of what could happen if somebody in power didn't think your books were appropriate. They could be taken away. Talk to me about that. Were you, I mean, you're writing about topics, puberty, all of these things. Were other writers writing about this at the same time? You know, I didn't set out to do anything <laughs> except tell stories as well as I could. And I mean, when I started to write, I went to the library and I came home with armloads of books and I would read them at night after the kids were asleep. These I love, these bore me, and I would make stacks. And the ones I loved, they, you know, these were the books. I wanted to write books like these. And while they may not have been, you know, the same subjects that I wanted to write about, I was always fascinated by puberty. I mean, let's face it, I was obsessed for a year in my life with puberty. I did all those exercises. I, you know, I pricked my finger and put blood on a sanitary napkin to see what it would be like. I wore it to school um, to prove to my friends that I had my period. I lied about getting my period, which I didn't get till I was 14. I knew that I wanted to write about this, but I wanted to write books that engage kids in the way that Beverly Cleary's books engaged me. Um, she was my hero in the way that um, Louise Fitzhugh's Harriet the Spy engaged me, and in the way that um, the early books of E.L. Konigsberg engaged me. I wanted to write books like those, but, you know, in my own voice and, and telling the stories that I wanted to tell. But those were books that spoke to me and meant a great deal to me when I was starting to write. And, you know, the prayer is, is uh, please, 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 someday let me be published. And then, please, 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 someday let somebody actually read this book. And um, I never, never looked beyond that. Uh, I was very young and naive. You know, maybe not so much in years, but in experience. And where I was coming from, I was 
naive about it all. Maybe we all were more naive back then. We didn't have, you know, we, we didn't have the community of writers that young writers have today. And I, I envy them that. I think it's wonderful. I would have been so much less lonely in my life, I think, had I had Twitter. I would have found other people who were interested in what I was interested in. Um, you know, I went to every little meeting that I knew I could go to in New York. I went to every meeting because I so longed for connection, and I certainly didn't have it um, where I was living and the life that I was living with my husband. Well, how did people around you, I mean, you had these other women in your neighborhood who mocked you, you had this husband who wasn't quite sure, how did they respond when you're... Well, I don't want to say that the women mocked me. In some ways, um, they might have just been really uncomfortable about it because it's like, what is she doing? And where does that leave us? Uh, there was some mocking in the beginning, but, but um, I can't ever say that there was support. Not for not ever while I was living there. But it separated me from them in a way that wasn't really acceptable in those days. I mean, it sounds like what you were doing in some way challenged their own life choices. I think it challenged, I think what I was doing challenged their own life choices. But, you know, this was early and um, I like to say that the women's movement came very late to suburban New Jersey, to my cul-de-sac. And when it did, I think that, um, I know for me, it gave me courage. It gave me courage to do a lot of things, to think about a lot of things, and ultimately, probably to end my marriage. And although that's not what the women's movement was all about. It helped me find courage to make changes in my own life that I might never have made. So talk to me more about that. I mean, do you see yourself as a part of the women's movement? Absolutely. I'm, I'm a part of the women's movement even if nobody ever knew it but me. You know, it was inside me. It was um, I loved it. I subscribed to Ms. Magazine the second I learned about it. Um, my husband, in a very naive way, blamed fear of flying for the end of our marriage. Of course, it wasn't, you know, but, but he was looking for something that went wrong. And it is absolutely true that everything changed. Everything that we grew up with, all the values that we grew up with in the 50s um, and that our parents gave to us, and I'm talking us, other women like me, whose you know, mother's hopes and dreams were uh, college degree, marriage uh, to a professional man if possible so that you would have security, you would have a nice home. When I told my mother that I was getting divorced, you know what she said to me? She said, how can you leave that beautiful house? And that was just, you know, I know that she didn't know what to say. She didn't know how to comfort me. I was hurting. She didn't know how to give me what I needed. But that was what she said. And the second question was, what am I going to tell my friends? Because it was so off the wall to her that Judy is going to leave this secure life and, um, and who knows what's in store for her. Did you have support when you made that choice? Were there people around you who were? No, I was so alone in my decision to leave my marriage. I felt so alone um, and scared. And I had two kids. 
Um, and again, I was married to a very decent guy. He was not a bad person. We just didn't change together, you know? And I, I grew up some and realized that I wanted more. I was then very adventurous. I was caught up in the whole scene. I wanted freedom. I've since learned other things, but in those days, I saw freedom as the way to go. I wanted to be free to do. Who sang the song? Um, Freedom's just another word for nothing left to lose. I don't know what he sang, but Chris Christopherson, uh, somebody else sang it. I, I wanted to be that person. I wanted to be out on the streets. I wanted to be protest. I don't mean living on the streets. I wanted to be protesting. I wanted to be yelling out. I wanted to be, I wanted to be part of what these brave women were part of. They were braver than I was. They knew more than I, they were, they had more connections than I had. Had I known them, I'd have been with them earlier, you know, but it was my own little feminist movement inside me. Talk to me about that time in your life where you have these two little kids, but you're also seeking to basically recreate your whole life. How do you balance those two things? Oh, well, I mean, by the time I left my marriage, they were 12 and 14. So all the time that they were small, I was writing. And um, I once said to them, or maybe to my son, how was it having a working mother when we lived on that street where no other mother worked. And he said, I never thought of you as a working mother. You were always home. Yeah, because I worked at home. And I, I think actually I never let them see the struggle. I should have. I, they, I didn't involve them in the struggle. Um, to do this in, in the determination. I was somehow separated the two, and I was mommy. Um, and then I was this person um, determined. Why do you say you me. should have shown them the struggle? What do you think they would have learned? I think it would have been better. I don't know. I, I just think that it's better if uh, kids see how hard it is and how hard you have to work to make something happen doesn't just happen. I don't think they ever saw any of that. You know, it was just what I did. The second they walked in the door at three o'clock, my writing day was over. I was done. I worked while they were not at home. So they weren't really Involved. They were involved in the stories that were coming out of the typewriter. You know, my daughter would pull the pages out. She was a reader, and she would read them um, right away. But I don't think that I, I do. I think it's important to let your kids know that it's life is a struggle, and it's wonderful but it takes hard work and determination. So you decide to divorce and you have a 12-year-old and a 14-year-old? Yeah, the worst times possible to divorce with a 12-year-old and a 14-year-old. I was totally crazy then, I have to say, looking back. I don't know, I'd, I think I just went a little bit off. Um, we got through it, but I was not a mature person then. Well, I'm interested in that because it seems to me like parents are constantly trying to balance the needs of their children with the needs that they have to have personal fulfillment. And I'm just wondering what you think about that and how do you strike that balance? Yeah, well, in the 70s, personal fulfillment le meant all this freedom and it meant freedom, sexual freedom. <laughs> And I wanted that, and that is not the best thing um, for your 12 and 14 year old. 
kids. And so I basically, I jumped, you know, I jumped into the fire, or what do we say, from the fire to the pan, or the pan to the fire. And I married like the first guy I met. I met him on a plane, I married him, it was a disaster. And, um, and, and what was hardest uh, was to have to admit to my mother, to my former husband, to my children, to myself, that I had made a terrible mistake. But I was getting out of the terrible mistake. It was a very, very rough time. And you know what? Through the worst times in my life, I've been able to write, and writing that writing has saved me. And my daughter says that to me a lot. I don't know how you can do this. How could you ever do that, and how can you do that now? And it's because when I go into that little room, I lose myself in the characters, and I think that helps keep me sane, and it helps to keep me going. I'm not crazy anymore, by the way. Some people might not agree, but I'm telling you, I'm not. And I've been in a wonderful, incredible um, relationship, marriage, for 31 years, and it was well worth waiting for. But I didn't make that decision wisely. It just kind of fell in my lap, and you know, here's this guy, and oh, he seems nice, and um, I didn't marry right away, it took seven years, but we were together from our second date because we did things like that in the 70s. I want to go back to your writing. Um, I'm wondering, I'm hoping you can describe for me a few of the books that you've um, written for preteens and just the t kind of topics that you were tackling in the 70s that were pretty unusual for that time. Yeah, I don't know that I knew that they were unusual. I mean, I read a lot, so maybe I did. I don't know, I, I, I just know that the day I finished Margaret, I started then again, maybe I won't. I figured I was a 12-year-old girl. I was so fast then for six months. Now I'm so slow. And now I'm gonna be a 12-year-old boy for the next six months. And I wrote about Tony in Then Again, Maybe I Won't. And that was a time when women were not supposed to write about men. You were not supposed to write from a boy's point of view if you weren't a guy, and vice versa. Um, but I loved being a boy, and I learned a lot about being a boy from Tony. Um, and thanks to my editor, I learned a lot about a boy's puberty because some of the things that I thought and I put into the book, he said, oh, <laughs> no, that's not how it is. <laughs> and so he was wonderful working with me on that book. And then, gosh, I can't remember, I wrote. Well, tell me more uh, about Tony. What was he going through? Tony had an interesting family. Tony's family, blue collar, Jersey City, New Jersey. He had a paper route. Um, his mother sold women's lingerie at Orbex. Uh, he had a brother who was a teacher. Brother had just gotten married. Angie, his wife, announces she's pregnant. They really don't have the money. Um, his dad works for, I can't remember what his dad works for, but he's in the basement all the time, kind of like my father. He's in the basement all the time and he's inventing things. And Tony's father invents something what were they called? It was like, uh, I can't remember what they're called, but anyway, it was what, because I wanted to have lamps in the middle of the room that you didn't have to plug in. And so oh, they, he called them electrical cartridges. They were like, somebody said to me, they were like batteries. And recently somebody wrote to me and said, because there was a big story in the Times about this new discovery. And this guy wrote to me and he said, well, Judy, how do you feel? You know, somebody's finally done electrical cartridges. <laughs> and he invents electrical cartridges and, you know, he gets rich, he makes it big, they move to suburban Long Island. Um, they get a big house and Tony's life changes not for the better. To Tony, um, you know, everything is falling apart. It was better when they were struggling. Um, 
the mother becomes social climbing, the kid next door uh, steals, the girl next door gets undressed and leaves the windows open. I don't think he's upset about that. He likes that. He watches with binoculars. That got me in a lot of trouble. Um, grandma is relegated, you know, taken out of the kitchen, which was her raison d'etre. And um, so uh, I like interesting family stories. I'm, I like to do much more complicated books now. Sometimes I read these books and I think, how simple, you know, would I do this today? Could I do this today? I'm not sure that I could. And yet kids, you know, are still relating to them in the same way. Blubber about bullying based on something that happened in my daughter's fifth grade classroom. Um, and then forever. And, uh, you know, my daughter was 14 and she said she was reading all these books about kids who, God forbid, if the girl succumbed and had sex, she would be punished. A grisly abortion. Um, maybe she would die being shipped off to Aunt Betty's house somewhere else. And Randy said to me, couldn't there ever be a story about two nice kids who do it and nobody has to die? And I, it's the worst reason for writing a book, frankly, but I thought, yeah, I mean, what's the message here? I wanted to show sexuality with responsibility. And damn, I wanted girls to have a good time. I was a girl. I mean, this was fun. I got so many angry letters from women who said, how dare you let her have an orgasm? How dare you? I've, you know, I've been married for 30 years and I've never had one. And I'm like, well, I don't know. I always did. So, uh, you know, I just didn't think it was a big deal. Um, but I got in a lot of trouble for that. Talk to me about that because it started to become a really big deal. You keep publishing these books and then... Not in the 70s. The 70s was a great time for um, children's book writers, children's books, and therefore young readers, I think. And in 1980, everything started to go the other way. Um, you know, with the presidential election in 1980, the next day, the censors were out calling the American Library Association. They wanted this band and that band and this off the shelf. They were challenging everything. Schools, school libraries um, weren't prepared. They didn't have any policy in place. And, you know, a parent would run into school waving some book and saying, take this off the shelf. And the librarian, often because she or he didn't know what to do, would take it off the shelf. Today, I'm happy to say librarians and teachers know, usually, that there are policies in place, there are formal um, challenges that have to be made, committees have to go, but it still happens all the time. It happened to my books in the Florida Keys. I, I live there, and it happened um, recently in the Florida Keys. How did that make you feel when it originally started to happen in the 80s? Well, at first, um, you know, it was scary and, and sad. And not unlike those first rejections that made me cry because I didn't know what else to do. And then when I learned about organizations I could join and I could work with them to help, not just keep my books on the shelf, but there were so many books being challenged. There still are. Um, then I felt more empowered. It's always, you know, it's the group. You're part of a group. You can't necessarily do it on your own, although I certainly tried before I met up with NCAC, National Coalition Against Censorship. But once I did, it's that being part of the group. I'm not alone. The same thing going back to the women's movement. I'm not alone. What were these parents saying? In those days, the complaints, uh, the challenges to books were all coming from the religious right. That, of course, it's contagious. 
And so all these years later, it's coming from every side all over the place, you know. In those days, it was, it was really coming from the religious right. Um, there were pamphlets put out uh, called How to Rid Your Schools and Libraries of Judy Bloom Books. And I had my secretary send away for one. They were actually being handed out at supermarkets and malls. Um, and it, you know, never did it say you had to read the book. It just said you have to say this and this and this, uh, page something, and, you know, cite things totally out of context. Um, and, I mean, it, it, it was infuriating. It was infuriating before. I, I came to n never accept it, but I came to understand that this was happening, it was going to happen, and we had better do something about it. What specifically were they taking issue with, if you can just describe their argument against the books? Uh, they believed that puberty was a dirty word, that anything that had to do with puberty, not that it was you know, natural and normal and every child was going to go through it whether they wanted them to or not, it was, uh, I want to be the one to tell my child, but of course they never did. They never did, or their children wouldn't have read it first in my books and come to them with questions. They did not want their kids to read these books that would lead to questions. There was this feeling that if, if my kids don't know about it, my kids won't do it. If my kids don't read about it, they won't know about it and it'll never happen to them. Um, puberty, uh, you know, that's what it was all about. My, my books were challenged mainly for puberty, language, and um, something, oh, if only I can remember it, um, lack of moral something or other. I can't even remember what it was. Something that I, like, what? Because I didn't hit the kids over the head. For instance, in Blubber, you know, which is very tough even today to read. Grown-ups don't want to read about how bad life can be for kids when they're young, the things that happen at school. And now, of course, PC, like everything is anti-bullying programs here and there. Maybe they'll work. I hope they do. I don't know, because there's a universality to a child's life, and adults can't control it, and that's tough, and all you can do is you can be there for the kids, and yeah, you can try. You can you can try in schools to bring it. I think that any any teacher who was brave enough to read Blubber aloud in the classroom, and then talk about it because you can't close the book and forget about it, talk about it, bring it to the surface. That's good. That's positive. But I know a teacher. This is long ago now. Who read that book every year at the start of fifth grade? Read it to his class. And he was no longer allowed to. His principal told him, you can't read that anymore. And he stopped teaching. How many good teachers did we lead, lose during this period because they were told? And it was fear. I mean, it's all about fear. So I, I think that's, I think we're doing a little better there. Although I did just get a, I just got a tweet from somebody who said, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a substitute at elementary schools. And when I read your books aloud, I read every word the way you wrote it. But the kids in the class said, oh, our teacher goes beep, 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 beep. Or our teacher substitutes uh, uh, silly for stupid. So, you know, still happens. So you started earlier, you mentioned that you took uh, three copies of the book to your daughter's school <laughs> and the principal, if you can just tell that story. Yes, when I... Yeah, I gave three copies of Are You There, God, It's Me, Margaret, because I was proud and excited to my children's elementary school. And the male principal um, took them off the shelf, refused to have them there because he said, um, uh, girls in this school are not old enough to read about menstruation. Now, how about the fifth and sixth grade girls who had their periods, right? No. He didn't want anybody to be able to read about menstruation. Can you believe menstruation was such a, such a wicked subject? I mean, it, it's hard to believe looking back now. Um, 
And did you fight him on that? I did not fight him. I fought him once, and he chased me down the hall with a chair, like this. <laughs> but that was about something else. Uh, we were never, I don't think we were ever friends. I was a little rebellious then, you know? The kids had been locked out of school on a hot day, and nobody was there. All the kids, the bus didn't come, and they were locked out. Nobody had cell phones then. And when I went to talk to him about it, he chased me down the hallway with this chair, threatening me. He sounds like quite a character. Did you ever think that maybe there is some validity to the arguments that these parents are making, that it is up to them to decide when to introduce these ideas to their own children? Well, I think um, that's fine, but you can't decide what's right for everybody else's children. You can't challenge a book, demand that a book be removed from the, shelf, from the shelf because you don't want your child to read about it, then you have to monitor what your child is reading. Of course you can't because your child can go to a friend's house or the public library or anywhere else. Um, but you cannot, you cannot say, I don't want this book in the library because I don't want my child to read it when everybody else's children have the right to read it. You can't do that. So I've been talking a lot about the backlash that your books have received, but we should talk about how much people love them. I mean, at what point and did that's you... that's the nice part. <laughs> no, Thank you. Really nice part. <laughs> that's the fun part. Yeah. Can you talk to me about um, when, you, when you realized that your books were connecting with these young readers? My first letters um, came, you know, snail mail then, came from girls who were reading Margaret. And then it just grew and grew and grew and grew um, to the point where I once thought I need to collect these letters and put them in a book because maybe that will speak to other children and parents. And I did that. I thought it would be a six-month project. It took me three years and three intensely emotional years. And I was sorry once I got into it that I was doing it. Um, because the way I connected the topics that the children were writing about was by sharing um, my personal life. And that was tough at the time, and some of it very painful, some of it ridiculously naive. Um, I keep saying that. Do you think you keep saying that till you die, I wonder? <laughs> Well, I look back at 85 and say, oh, I was so naive at 73. Oh, I don't, I don't know. I'm wondering if you can tell me specifically what were these kids saying in these letters? They were sharing their innermost feelings. I think sometimes it's easier to, you know, take a pencil and write it down and put it in an envelope and send it away than it is to tell it to your parents, the people who see you at the breakfast table every day. And they were sharing, I mean, their deepest concerns, whether it was about friendship or family life, um, the pain of divorce and separation, loss, death, things that they were thinking about, things that they were going through, certainly puberty, um, sexuality, um, drugs, uh, everything, everything. Today, you know, I still get a lot of mail, but it basically comes, it's, it's email that comes to my website. And sometimes it's still very, very, very tough. I just had one from a, a child whose parents were divorced. Her mother died after the divorce. And now her father was remarrying, and she was at a loss. What do I do? Who do I talk to? She was not happy about this. Turned out that she also had a sister who then wrote to me. I'm not sure that there aren't more children in that family. Um, uh, and those are letters that I take very seriously, and I answer myself. But there are so many other places that kids can go now to find out, you know, to find out that they're not alone because they can go online and find out I'm not the only one who's feeling this way and that's good. So I grew up reading 
pretty much all of your books. And now I have a niece who's 12 and she's read all of your books. And I'm wondering, why do you think they continue to resonate over time? What is it about them that? Oh, I wish I knew. I, they identify, I don't know. I don't know what it is. I, if I knew, maybe I would never be able to do it again. I, I, I don't know that we ever understand what it is that makes our readers, um, you know, care so much about our characters in our books. But what I do tell moms and aunts um, is don't tell the next generation, oh, I grew up on these books and I want you to love them too because that's sure to turn them off. You have to just leave them around the house because otherwise it's like they can't be cool if my mom read them and now probably soon it'll be grandma read them. Um, so just leave them around. But it is, it is wonderful. I mean, to have uh, my earliest readers are in their 40s. My first readers are in their 40s. And, you know, they go down to today's seven-year-olds, six-year-olds. And that's very, it's been the most rewarding career, I think, anyone could have. I'm, I feel very lucky. People respond so strongly to your books, either negatively or positively, and I'm wondering, do you ever think about the audience when you're writing over time? Does that start to influence your writing process? I think it's a bad idea to think about your audience when you're writing, and it's a bad idea to think about your critics. And I think I was really lucky when I started out that I didn't know anybody who wrote, and I didn't know anything about publishing or anything about the world of writing and writers, and so I just did it. Spontaneously, um, I just did it. It's, it's much harder now because I know so much more, uh, but I do find when I'm in that room, because I'm writing now, and I have no idea what age group I'm writing for. I don't know who's gonna read this book. I just know that I have to tell this story, and um, it, it's set, it's the first book that I've ever set really in the 50s um, when I was coming of age. And, and the one thing about the 50s was that we all pretended, we pretended that everything was okay. People did not talk about what was going on. There were family secrets and you kept them. You didn't tell your best friend. I had a best friend who is still my best friend. We met in seventh grade. And we were so close, so close, and we still are. But in those days, we didn't really tell each other what was deep, deep, deep inside. We knew we liked each other a lot. We had a great time together. But no, those 50s kind of things that were kept buried because what would the neighbors say or how would this look if it got out? Our family has to be perfect and no family is perfect and we all have family secrets. And I'm writing about that, only this time I get to know all the family secrets. It seems like in some way you were always writing about that. that that's sort of a through line through a lot of your books that there are these secrets in these families. Yeah, I hated secrets. I hated it when I was a kid, and I knew that they were keeping secrets. Don't tell the children, don't tell the children. Um, I knew it, and so I invented it. And what I invented was usually much worse than the reality. If they had been honest with me and told me and talked to me about some of it, I wouldn't have been so anxious, and I wouldn't have been creating these stories um, of what it was all about. Yes, yeah, Sally Friedman hates the secrets, and Sally Friedman has m the imagination and is always coming up with the crazy stories. So I just want to go back uh, or switch gears into the women's movement. Mm -hmm. Do you identify yourself as a feminist? Is that? Absolutely. A feminist to me is a good word. A feminist to my husband is a good word. He would tell you, I'm a feminist. Um, it, it, the way I saw it was equality. 
between the sexes. You know, men and women are equal. And um, there's no reason why women can't do all the things that men do, well, most of them, <laughs> and vice versa. And um, that was what it was all about for me. I, I don't want to be imprisoned. I want to be set free. Uh, you know, we, my, my generation married, mo many of us, uh, all the women I know, married before we were out of college or right almost after we graduated from college. We didn't have a chance to grow up. We didn't have a chance to find out what we might have been able to do. We had to take our chances much later. I mean, again, my generation, many of them, uh, didn't start finding out what they could do as early as I did, but they, the lucky ones found out later, and they went and they made careers for themselves within those original marriages or, or not. But um, that was good. That was good. Why do you think so many people, particularly in my generation and younger, see feminism as a dirty word? Why does it has it have this bad reputation now? Why? I don't understand why younger people think feminism is a bad word. They just maybe they just don't know. They they don't know. They don't know what it was like to worry all the time about getting pregnant, to to be terrified. Um, you know, even within. Within our marriages, some young people today, I think, don't get what it was like um, before abortion was legal. I, for instance, I went to an all-girls public high school, and in my graduating class, two of the top girls, I think one was valedictorian, two of the top girls were pregnant at graduation. They didn't tell us at the time, you know, and 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 those hasty marriages and having babies that just changed their lives. I mean, that was a huge thing in life. And and those of us who call ourselves feminists and came of age in the women's movement, it was never that we didn't like men. We wanted to be free in a way that men were free. Yes, we wanted men to grow up with us, and many of them did. I mean, I, and I see my son, um, as a man in his 40s today, has a very, very, very different outlook than any guy I knew uh, when I was young. He understands women. He likes women as people. My husband really enjoys talking to women. He may like them, you know, sexually. There's always that, you know, attract. there's always that question. But can men and women really be friends without any sexual anything going on between them? And I can't answer that question. I'm not sure. I don't know. I don't know. Maybe eventually we can. <laughs> Again, I'm looking forward to that 85, but I'm not sure. I'm not at all sure. The, you know, so, okay, it's there. It doesn't mean you're going to act on it. But I like men and women working together and doing things together and being friends together. Do you think there have been any downsides to the women's movement? I don't know. I don't know. Um, not for me. Not for me. You know, the only thing is I hear from some very thoughtful young women, and I might agree with them on this, that um, they were raised to think that they could have it all. And I say, you can have it all, but maybe not all at the same time. Maybe it it's, you can have it all but serially, different times in your life. And you shouldn't think that you should be having it all at the same time and then beat up on yourself because you've got these babies and you can't pull it off. You can't do the work and have the babies and, 
and have a relationship, it's just really hard. That is a perfect segue into the advice that we're hoping you can give to young women. <laughs> I'm very cautious about giving advice. Yeah, the only advice I feel comfortable giving is, is to say to anybody, really, don't let anybody discourage you. If you feel it, if you need to do it, then you have to go out there even though they tell you you can't do it. I think, should I retire? Is it time to retire? And then I'll get this creative urge and and it's so exciting you know to have it again and i think i'm never i'm never going to retire as long as my mind is working why should i retire and this year i made a movie you know based on one of my books and that was such a that was such a thrilling experience one i don't want to do again but it was a thrilling experience and um and now you know i've got this new novel that i'm very excited about writing and so it's just great. I mean, I feel blessed. And, and every other writer I know um, kind of feels the same way. You know, there, there's, there's no age limit on it, as long as it's working, as long as there's a story to tell. I actually do have one more question before we do the one-word answers. What did your mother think about your success? Oh, my mother loved it. She loved it. My mother was a crackerjack typist. And maybe by the time I started writing, my mother had retired from her job um, at the law firm where she was a, a, a crackerjack typist. And she came and, and typed, you know, the final manuscript of my first few books. And uh, she liked that. I don't think I let her type forever. I'm pretty sure I didn't. And um, my mother went to high school with Philip Roth's mother. And Mrs. Roth met my mother on the street one day, and they were chatting. And she said, I have advice for you, Essie. When they ask you, where did she learn those things? You say, I don't know, but not from me. <laughs> um, but my mother, my mother was my greatest fan. Although, I have to say, I was once on Dr. Ruth's show, this is a long time ago, and we were talking about female masturbation. It was a Mother's Day show, and that's what we were talking about. My mother didn't know what we were going to be talking about and invited a group of her friends down to watch Judy on television. And it wasn't my mother who told me what happened, but one of the daughters of one of my mother's friends said, when that started, they all left. And my mother was horrified, as were all of her friends. Because, you know, my mother could never, ever talk about that. How I wish you, I wrote Dini because nobody ever, ever talked to me about that. And yet my friends and I talked all the time. Do you have a special place? Can you get that good feeling? Oh, me too. But nobody ever said to us, here's a little book, and this is what it's about, or just sit down and talk to us. No, so we thought it was bad. But at least we knew that we weren't alone, because we all had made this great discovery. That's great. Um, so now, one word answers. Uh-uh, one word answers. When you were a kid, what did you want to be when you grew up? A cowgirl or a movie star? Or a detective? What was your very first paying job? You know what? I never had a paying job. I never had a job until I started to write. I was never paid for anything. Which person who you've never met has had the biggest influence on your life? I think my father is the person who had the most influence on my life. Which three adjectives best describe this? <laughs> oh. I'm friendly. I'm a warrior. And I'm emotional in life, 
but less so in my writing. That's great. <laughs>